The Chronicles of Prydane by Lloyd Alexander. Book 5 The High King. Chapter 9 The Banner. Light snow fell before the companions had journeyed a day from King Smite's castle, and by the time they reached the valley of Yestrad, the slopes were white cloaked and ice had begun to sheathe the river. They forded while, while frozen splinters cut at the legs of their horses and winded through the bleak hill cantrevs, pressing eastward toward the free comets. Of all the band, Gurgi suffered most grievously from the cold. Though bundled in a huge garment of sheepskin, the unhappy creature shivered wretchedly. His lips were blue, his teeth chattered, and ice droplets clung to his matted hair. Nevertheless, he kept pace at Taran's side, and his numbed hands did not loosen their grip on the banner. Days of harsh travel brought them across small Arburn to Senarth, where Taran had chosen to begin the rallying of the comet folk. But even as he rode into the cluster of thatch-roofed cottages, he saw the village thronged with men, and among them Heviad the smith, barrel-chested and bristle-bearded, who shouldered his way through the crowd and clapped Tarn on the back with a hand that weighed as much as one of his own hammers. Bring good greeting to you, wanderer, called the smith. We saw you a war and gathered to welcome you. A good greeting to good friends, Tarn replied. But I bring a stern task in exchange for a warm welcome. Hear me, he went on urgently. What I ask is not asked lightly, nor granted lightly. The strength of your hands and the courage of your hearts, and, if it must be, even your lives. As the comet folk, murmuring, pressed around him, Taran spoke of what had befallen Gwydion and the rising of Arryn. When he had finished, the men were grim-faced, and for a long moment all stood silent. Then heavy the smith lifted his voice. Brother Volk of the three comets, honor King Math. And the house of gone, he said. But they will answer only to one they know as a friend. And follow him not in obligation, but in friendship. And so let Hemiad be the first to follow Tarin Wanderer. All follow, all, cried the comet man with a single voice. And on the instant, the once peaceful Senarth stirred like a gathering storm as each man hastened to arm himself. But Heavy again gave Tarn and the companions a hard grin. Our will is strong, but our weapons lack, he declared. But no matter, Wanderer, you toil bravely in my smithy. Now shall my smithy toil for you. And I will send word to every metalsmith in the Comet Lands to labor as hard for you as I myself will do. While the men readied their mounts and Heavy had set his forge to blazing, Taran led the companions to the neighboring comets. His task became quickly known, and each day brought its throng of herdsmen and farmers who needed no urging to march in the growing host, following the banner of the white pig. For Taran, days and nights emer merged into one another. In the marshalling camps, astride unflagging Melenless, he rode among the gatherings of peaceful men turned warriors, seeing to their provisions and equipment, and by the embers of watchfires held council with the new formed war bands. When he had accomplished all he could at Senarth, Heavy had rejoined Taran to serve as his master armorer. You have done your work well, but we still go too lightly armed. Taran said, speaking apart with the smith. I fear all the forges and priding will not be enough to serve our need. Somehow I must find a way. I am so you shall, with luck, called a voice. Taran turned to see a horseman who was riding up beside him and blinked in surprise, for this was the strangest garbed of all the comet warriors. The man was tall, lank-haired, with legs as spindly as a stork's and so long they almost touched the ground on either side of his mount. Bits of iron and odds and ends of metal were stitched closely all over his jacket. He carried a wooden staff with a scythe blade at the end. On his head he wore what had once been a cook pot, now worked and shaped into a makeshift helmet that sat so low on the man's forehead it nearly covered his eyes. Lanio! Taran cried, warmly clasping the new arrival's hand. Lanio, son of Lonwin! Not other, 
answered Linneo, pushing back his peculiar headpiece. Did you not suppose I'd be along sooner or later? But your wife and family, Tarn began. I would not ask you to leave them. Why, of children, I remember half a dozen. And another merrily on the way, Linneo replied, grinning happily. Perhaps twins with my kind of luck. But my brood will be safe enough till I return. Indeed, if there is ever to be safety in pride, ain't, I must follow the wanderer now. But your concern is not babes in arms, but men at arms. Hear me, friend wanderer, Linneo went on. I have seen pitchforks and hayrakes among the comet folk. Could not the tines be cut off and set in wooden shafts? Thus you would gain three, four, and even more weapons where you had only one to begin with. Bryce, so we could, burst out Heviod. How did I not see that myself? No more than I did, admitted Tarn. Lanio sees more sharply than any of us, but calls luck what another would call keen wits. Go, friend Lanio, see what you can. I know you'll find more than meets the eye. As Lanio, with the help of Heviod the smith, gleaned the comets for sickles, rakes, fire tongs, scythes, and pruning hooks, and found ways to make even the most unlikely objects serve a new purpose, the store of weapons grew. While well, each day Tarn rallied followers in greater numbers, Call, Gurgi, and Ilanwe helped load carts with gear and provisions, a task by no means to the liking of the princess, who was more eager to gallop from one comet to the next than she was to plod beside the heavy laden wagons. Ilanwe had donned man's garments and braided her hair with her, about her head, at her belt hung a sword and short dagger wheedled from heavy at the smith. Her warrior's garb was ill-fitting, but she took pride in it and was therefore all the more vexed when Tarn refused to let her go afield. You'll ride out with me, Tarn said, as soon as the pack animals are tended and their loads secured. The princess reluctantly agreed, but next day when Tarn cantered past the horses lined at the rear of the camp, she furiously cried to him, You've tricked me! These tasks will never be done! No sooner do I finish with one string of horses and carts than along comes more! Very well, I shall do as I promised! But war leader or no, Tarin of Care Dolbin, I'm not speaking to you! Tarin grinned and rode on. Bearing northward through the valley of Great Arvern, the companions entered Comet Gwyneth and had scarcely dismounted when Tarin heard a cackling voice call out, Wanderer! <laughs> I know you seek warriors, not crones, but tarry a moment and give a greeting to one who has not forgotten you. Dwyvac, the weaver woman of Gwynneth, stood in her cottage doorway. Despite her white hair and wizened features, she looked as lively and untired as ever. Her gray eyes scanned Tarn sharply, then turned to Ilanwe. The ancient weaver woman beckoned to her. Tarn wanderer, I know well enough. But who you may be, I can guess well enough, even though you go in the guise of a man and your hair could stand a little washing. She glanced shrewdly at the princess. Indeed, I was sure when the wanderer and I first met that he had a pretty maiden in his thoughts. Hump! Alonwe sniffed. I'm not sure if he did then, and even less sure if he does now. Dwyvac chuckled. <laughs> if you are not, then no one else can be. Time will tell which of us is right. But meanwhile, child, she added, unfolding a cloak she held in her withered hands and setting it about our lonely shoulders. Take this as a gift from a crone to a maiden. And no, there is not so much difference between the two. For even a tottering grandam keeps a portion of girlish heart and the youngest maiden a thread of old woman's wisdom. Tarn had now come to the cottage door. He warmly greeted the weaver woman and admired the cloak she had given Ilanwe. Heavy it in the comet smith's labor to make us arms, he said. But warriors need warmth to, as much as weapons. Alas, we have no garments like this. Do you think a weaver woman less hardy than a metal smith? Dwyvek replied. As you wove patiently at my loom, now my loom will weave the more quickly for you. And in every comet, shuttles will fly for the sake of Tar and Wanderer. Heartened by the weaver woman's promise, the companions departed from Gwynnet. A short distance from the comet, Taran caught sight of a small band of horsemen riding toward him at a quick pace. Leading them was a tall youth who shouted Taran's name and raised a hand in greeting. 
With a glad cry, Taran urged Malinless to meet the riders. Lassar! Taran called, reining up beside the young man. I did not think you and I would meet so far from your sheepfold in Kamat Isav. Your news travels ahead of you, wanderer, Lassar replied. But I feared you would deem our comet too small and pass it by. It was I, he added with shy hesitation that could not altogether conceal his boyish pride. It was I who led our folk to find you. The size of Isav is no measure of its courage, Taran said, and I need and welcome all of you. But where is your father? He asked, glancing at the band of riders. Where is Drudwas? He would not let his son journey so far without him. Lassar's face fell. The winter took him from us. I grieve for him, but honor his memory by doing what he himself would have done. And what of your mother? Tarn asked as he and Lassar trotted back to join the companions. Was it her wish, too, that you leave home and flock? Others will tend my flock, the young shepherd answered. My mother's mother knows what a child must do and what a man must do. I am a man, he added stoutly, and have been one since you and I stood against Doroth and his ruffians that night in the sheepfold. Yes, yes, cried Gurgi, and fearless Gurgi stood against them too. I'm sure all of you did, Ilanwe remarked sourly. Well, I was curtsying and having my hair washed on Mona. I don't know who Doroth is, but if I should ever meet him, I promise you I'll make up for lost time. Tarrant shook his head. Count yourself lucky you don't know him. I know him all too well, to my sorrow. He has not troubled us since that night, said Lassar. Nor will he likely trouble us again. I have heard he has left the comet lands and rose westward. He has put his sword in the surface of the Death Lord, it is said. Perhaps it may be so, but if Doroth serves anyone, it is himself. Your service freely given counts more for us than any the Lord of Anuvin could hire. Taran said to Lassar, Prince Grydian will be grateful to you. To you, rather, said Lassar. Our pride is not in fighting, but in farming, in the work of our hands, not our blades. Never have we sought war. We come now to the banner of the white pig because it is the banner of our friend, Taran Wanderer. The weather worsened as the companions continued through the valley, and the growing host of comet men forced them to travel at a slower pace. The days were too short for the work to be done, but Tarn rode grimly on. Beside him galloped Call, uncomplaining and ever cheerful. His broad face, reddened and roughened by cold and wind, was nearly hidden by the collar of a great fleece-lined jacket. A sword belt of heavy iron links bound his girth, and at his back hung a round shield of oxhide. He had found a helmet of beaten metal, but deemed it did not sit as comfortably on his bald crown as had his old leather cap. Tarn was grateful for Call's wisdom and gladly sought his counsel. It was Call who gave him the thought, as the marshalling camps grew crowded, to send smaller, swifter bands directly to Cairdathiel, rather than march from one comet to the next with a force becoming ever more cumbersome. Lassar, Heviot, and Lanil would not leave Tarn's vanguard and stayed ever close at hand. But when Tarn wrapped himself in a cloak and stretched on the frozen ground for rare moments of sleep, it was Call who stood watch over him. You are the oaken staff I lean on, Tarn said. More than that, he laughed. You're the whole sturdy tree and a true warrior. Call, instead of beaming, looked wryly at him. Do you mean to honor me? He asked. Then say rather I am a true grower of turnips and a gatherer of apples. No warrior whatever, save that I am needed thus for a while. My garden longs for me as much as I long for it, Call added. I left it unready for winter, and for that I will pay a sorry reckoning in spring planting. Taran nodded. We shall dig and weed together, true grower of turnips, and true friend. The watchfires flickered in the night. The horses stirred in their lines. About them, a mass of deep shadows, dark against darkness, lay sleeping warriors. The chill wind cut at Taran's face. He was suddenly weary to the marrow of his bones. He turned to call. My heart too will be easier, he said, when I am once more an assistant pig keeper. Word reached Taran that King Smite had raised a strong host amongst the Cantrev lords and was now turning northward. The companions learned too that certain of Arryn's liegemen had sent war parties across Ystrad to harass the columns marching to Cairdathiel. 
Tarn's task thus grew more urgent, but he could do no more than press onward with all haste. The companions made their way to Comet Mirin. For Tarn, it had been among the fairest he had known in all his wanderings. Even now, amid the tumult of warriors arming, of neighing horses and shouting riders, the white, thatched cottages of the little village seemed to stand peaceful and apart. Tarn galloped past the common fields, ringed by hemlocks and tall firs. His heart laden with memories, he reined up at a familiar hut, whose smoking chimney betokened a warm fire within. The door opened, and out stepped a stocky, hale old man, garbed in a coarse brown robe. His iron-gray hair and beard were cropped short. His eyes were blue and undimmed. Well met, he called to Tarn, and raised a huge hand crusted with dried clay. You left us a wanderer and returned to us a war leader. As for your skill in the latter, I have heard much. But I ask, have you forgotten your skill at my potter's wheel? Or have I wasted my own to teach you? Well met, Anlock Clay Shaper, Tarn answered, swinging down from a lendless and fondly clasping the old potter's hand. <laughs> wasted in truth, Tarn laughed, following him into the hut. For the master had a clumsy apprentice. My skill lacks, but not my memory. What little I could learn, I have not forgotten. Show me then, challenged the potter, scooping a handful of wet clay from a wooden trough. Tarn smiled sadly and shook his head. I halted only to give you greeting, he replied. Now I labor with swords, not earthen bowls. Nevertheless, he paused. The hearth light glowed on shelves and rows of pottery, of graceful wine jars, of ewers handsomely and lovingly crafted. Quickly, he took the cool clay and cast it upon the wheel which Anlon had begun to spin. Tarn pre time pressed him too closely, Tarn knew. Yet, as the work took form under his hands, for a moment he put down the burden of his other task. The days turned back, and there was only the whirring of the wheel and the shape of the vessel borne from the shapeless clay. Well done, said Anlon in a quiet voice. Then added, I have heard how smiths and weavers throughout the comets labor to give you arms and raiment. But my wheel cannot forge a blade nor weave a warrior's cloak. And my clay is shaped only for peaceful tasks. Alas, I can offer nothing that will serve you now. You have given me more than all the others, Tarn answered, and I treasure it the most. My way is not the warrior's way, yet if I do not bear my sword now, there will be no place in Prydain for the usefulness and beauty of any craftsman's handiwork. And if I fail, I will have lost all I gained from you. His hand faltered, for Call's booming voice was shouting his name. Tarn sprang from the wheel, and while Anla watched in alarm, strode out to the hut, calling a hurried farewell to the potter. Call had already drawn his sword, and another moment Lassar joined them. They galloped toward the camp a little way from Marin, as Call hastily told Tarn that the guard post had sighted a band of marauders. They shall soon be upon us, Call warned. We should meet them before they attack our trains. As a grower of turnips, I advise you to rouse a company of bowmen and a troop of good riders. Lassar and I shall try to lure them with a smaller band of warriors. Quickly, they set their plans. Tarn rode ahead, calling to the horsemen and foot soldiers, who hastily caught up their weapons and followed after him. He ordered Ilanwe and Gurgi to safety among the carts, without waiting to hear their protests. He galloped toward the fir forest, covering the outlying hills. The marauders were armed more heavily than Tarn had expected. Swiftly, they sped down from the snow-covered ridge. At a sign from Tarn, the bowmen raced and flung themselves into a shallow gully, and the mounted warriors of the comets wheeled to the charge. The riders met in a tumult of hooves and clash of blades. Then Tarn raised his horn to his lips. At the piercing, echoing signal, the bowmen rose from cover. It was, Tarn knew, little more than a skirmish, but sharply and hotly fought. Only at the last, when Colin Lassar's band drew off many of the foe, did the marauders break and flee. Yet it was the first battle Tarn had commanded as a war leader for the Prince of Dawn. The Comet folk had carried the day, with none of their numbers slain and only a few wounded. Though weary and drained of his strength, Tarn's heart pounded with the joy of victory as he led the exulting warriors from the forest and back toward Mirin. As he reached the hill crest, he saw flames and black billows of smoke. At first, he thought the camp had taken fire. He spurred Melinless at top speed down the slope. As he drew closer, as the crimson tongues wavered against the sky in a blood-stained sunset, 
and the smoke rose and spread over the valley. He saw it was the comet burning. Out distancing the troop, he galloped into Marin. Among the warriors from the camp, Tarn glimpsed Ilanwe and Gurgi struggling vainly to quench the flames. Call had reached the village before him. Tarn leaped from Elenlis and ran to his side. Too late, Call cried. The raiders circled and stormed the comet from the rear. Marin has been put to the torch and its folk to the sword. With a terrible cry of grief and rage, Tarn ran past the blazing cottages. The thatch had burned from the roofs, and many of the walls had split and crumbled. So it was with the hut of Anlaw, which still smoldered, its ruins open to the sky. The body of the potter lay amid the rubble. Of the work of his hands, all had been shattered. The wheel was overturned, the bowl flung into pieces. Tarn dropped to his knees. Call's hand was on his shoulder, but he drew himself away and stared up at the old warrior. Did I shout for victory today? he whispered hoarsely. Small comfort to folk who once befriended me. Have I served them well? The blood of Marin is on my hands. Later, Lassar spoke apart with Call. The wanderer is not stirred from the potter's hut, the shepherd murmured. It is harsh enough for each man to bear his own wound. But he who leads bears the wounds of all who follow him. Call nodded. Leave him where he chooses to be. In the morning, he will be well, he added, though likely never healed. By midwinter, the last of the war bands had been gathered and the comet warriors dispatched to Cairdathiel. In addition to a troop of horsemen, Lassar, Heviot, and Laniel still remained with Tarin, who now led the companions northwestward through the Lagradorn Mountains. The force was strong enough to safeguard their progress without slowing their journey. Twice marauders attacked them, and twice Tarn's followers beat them off, inflicting heavy losses. The raiders, having learned a bitter lesson from the war leader who rode under the ensign of the white pig, slunk away and dared harass the columns no further. The companions passed swiftly and unhindered through the foothills of the Eagle Mountains. Gurgi still proudly carried the banner which snapped and fluttered in the sharp winds lashing from the distant heights. In his cloak, Tarn bore one talisman, a shard of broken, fire-blackened pottery from Comet Marin. At the approaches to Cairdathiel, outriders brought word of still another host. Tarn galloped ahead, and a vanguard of spearmen rode fluid or flam. Great belly! shouted the bard, urging Lion to Tarn's side. Gwydion shall rejoice! The northern lords arm in all their strength! When a flam commands, uh, yes, well, uh, I did rally them in the name of Gwydion. Uh, otherwise, they might not have been so willing. Uh, but no matter, they're on the way. I've heard King Pryderi, too, has raised his armies. Then you'll see a battle host. I dare say, half the western cantrives are under his command. Oh, yes. Fluider added as Tarn caught sight of Glue perched atop a sway-backed, heavy-hoofed gray horse. The little fellow is still with us! The former giant, busily gnawing a bone, gave Tarn only a scant sign of recognition. I don't know what to do with him! Fluider said in a low voice. I hadn't the heart to send him packing! Not in the midst of all the armies gathering! So here he is! He's not stopped whining and complaining! His feet hurt one day, his head the next, and little by little, all the rest of him. Then, in between meals, he goes on with his endless tales of when he was a giant. The worst of it is, Fluider went on in some dismay, he's given my ears such a drubbing that he's made me almost feel sorry for him. He's a small-hearted weasel, always was and always will be. But as you stop and think on it, he has been considerably mistreated and put upon. Now, when Glue was a giant... The bard interrupted himself and clapped a hand to his forehead. Enough! Any more of his chatter and I'll end up believing it! Come, join us! He cried, unslinging his harp from the tangle of bows, quivers of arrows, bucklers, and leather strappings he bore on his back. All friends are met again! I'll play you a tune to celebrate and keep us warm at the same time. Cheered by the bard's music, the companions journeyed on together. Soon, the high fortress of Cairdathiel rose golden in the winter sunlight. 
Its mighty bastions sprang up like eagles impatient for the sky. Beyond the walls, encircling the fortress, stood the camps and flag-decked pavilions of lords come in allegiance to the House of Dawn. Yet it was not the sight of the banners or the wind-tossed emblems of the golden sunburst that made Taran's heart leap, but rather the knowledge that the companions and comet warriors had come safe to the end of one journey, to warmth and rest for a little time at least. Safe, Taran halted in his own thoughts, and the memories returned. Of Rune, king of Mona, who slept silent before the gates of Ker Kadarn, of Anlaw Clayshaper, and his fingers clenched around the fragment of pottery. 